great to see all of you. Hey, we're going to have a great day. Hey, we're going to start off by singing uh, a song that we sang last week that was so fun. So we're going to start by singing together. But first, I want to unite around Scripture. And I want to read from Psalm 121. And it says this, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As we gather today, isn't it good to know that our help comes from the one who has made the very earth that we stand on right now? He is capable. He is able. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ever think or imagine. So let's lift our voices together and let's join in and let's worship our Savior. Come on. Jesus. Oh 
make some noise. Are you glad to be here this morning? Worshiping together. Real quick, can we do this? Are you as thankful as I am for the band, the musicians, these pastors that we have up here? I love you guys. I know it's not like about that, but I just, I gotta say it sometimes. Welcome, welcome. My name's Andrew, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet. Especially if you're new here. Uh, if you're new here, we have a little gift that we want to give you just to say thanks for being here. Coffee on us this week. Do this at any point in today's service. Just grab your phone, start a new text to 23101. That's kind of the number that you can text stuff to here, you know, how everybody does it now these days. So text a new to 23101. Get a $5 Starbucks gift card on us just to say thanks. And so now you only got to pay like 40 cents to get some coffee this week. So do that this week. If you're new here, please take advantage of that. And also, this coming weekend, we're super excited about, A, it's the Super Bowl. Some, come on, somebody. That's right. But it's baptism weekend. That's why we're really excited. So we're smashing them together, and we're calling it Super Baptism Weekend. Wear your jerseys. We're going to have tons of fun f football stuff in the lobby. That's going to be awesome. And it's baptism weekend. You can get signed up for that at cotm.info. You'll hear some more information about that. But we do have a little business to attend to from last weekend. We were here last weekend. We did some conference uh, championship giveaways for some Super Bowl prize packs. And I have two winners here. Let's just kind of hail Mary and see if they're in the room right now. Joey Settles or Jason Harris in the house? Out there, anybody, anybody? We got their numbers, we'll text them, don't worry. Give it up for our winners. They won some Super Bowl prize packs. Tons of snacks, B-dubs, gift cards, drinks, and everything that's gonna be awesome. Hey, next weekend is the Super Bowl and baptism weekend. We can't wait. You can go to cotm.info, click on what's happening. You can see everything that's happening for that next weekend. We'll do this before we jump back into worship. Uh, greet the person next to you. Tell them your name. Ask them where you're from. Get to know them for just a second. And tell them who you got picked for the big game. Born and raised Kansas City guy. I got to do it. That's my pick.
the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Teach us to trust you, Jesus. To know that in the desert places of life, when it's quiet, when it seems like nothing is happening, you are moving, you are working, you are a God who specializes in reaching down into dark places, bringing your light, pulling us out, making us one with you. We trust you, Jesus. see it. We'll trust that you're working. Come on, in fact, let's sing that together. Even when I don't see it.
from our daughters conference this weekend. Yes, I see so many of the daughters in the house that spent the weekend with us. Heather, let's tell them a little bit about what Daughters is. Yeah, this was the launch of our women's ministry here at Church on the Move, and we gathered on Friday night and Saturday morning to uh, learn about our identity in the Father and freedom and purpose for our life, and it was a beautiful weekend. It was absolutely amazing. We had over 1,300 women from all of our church families come together and join us here. Yes, let's celebrate that. But this is the deal. If you're a lady in the room right now and you missed it, it's not too late. There's room for you. We want you to be a part of it next time. But I did want to share just a couple of highlights uh, from the weekend. I cannot believe how many people came and said, I came tired. I came worn out and I left refreshed and ready to conquer the world. Um, if you've never seen uh, an elementary school principal dance, my friend Kim is here and wow, wow, uh, we had so much fun. Uh, one of my favorite stories actually came in a text. One of my friends, I, I reached out to her because I saw her during the conference and just said, hey, how was it? She's a full generation younger than me. She's a young mom, uh, financial strains, and she almost didn't come, but she went ahead and came, said, I truly believe this weekend is a fresh start for me. I'm going to lean in to what my life actually is, which is truly beautiful and abundant, instead of being constantly consumed with what it isn't. It's been holding me down and disappointing me and distracting me for far too long. I'm ready to take a step. We had so much fun this weekend. Let's celebrate that. Let us celebrate that. This was an opportunity. You know, we all get so focused on the, the now and the day and the day to day. I have three girls of my own and one of my great joys is just to see them at home together talking and laughing they'll just be sitting on a couch watching a movie but they are at peace because they're sheltered and they're provided for and they're taken care of and this is what we wanted for the daughters of this house to gather together to be at peace to know that they are loved that they are cared for and i believe that every woman was seen that they were refreshed that they walked out with a new purpose and vision for their daily life and it was awesome it was awesome and this is just the very beginning um, if you came prepared to give let's switch to a moment of giving right now you know i love that as we lean into god with our finances he takes care of the kids and his family but he takes care of his daughters and his sons and the families represented. It's super easy to give here. We're gonna pass buckets down. You can give by cash or check, but the easiest way to give would be electronically. You can open up a text again to that number 23101 and just type in the word give and follow the prompts. If you brought your tithes and offerings, I wanna pray over them and uh, pray over you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you are a good, good father that cares about every area of our life. As I stand here now before you, I think of my friend Kendall, who was brave and courageous and came this weekend, even though money's tight. And Lord, I pray that anyone in our family that would be bold enough to say, Jesus, I'm gonna honor you with my finances, that you would meet them right where they are. I'm asking you to make yourself real to each of us in tangible ways, in ways that we wouldn't dream or think or imagine because you're good. We choose to partner with you in our finances, and we thank you for your provision. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is Ken Vaughn, and I will be reading today's scripture from Matthew, the third chapter, verses 13 uh, through 17. One of the things that I love that the Bible says about scripture is that all scripture is God breathed. And it is useful for teaching, training in righteousness, and equipping us for every good work. As we engage scripture this morning, I would encourage you to follow along in the message notes that you received when you walked through the doors or up on the screen. 
Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for your word is life. God, your word is light in every dark situation that we may be facing. And God, in this very moment, as we open our hearts and our minds, God, I just pray that you would speak to us this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church on the Move. My name is Witt, and uh, I want to say welcome this weekend. I also want to uh, echo what Heather and Jamie said. Man, this weekend was so incredible with our daughter's conference. If you were here, you know exactly what that was all about. It was an amazing weekend. I think a significant kind of landmark weekend for us as a church. I got to be here Friday night escorting Heather around and introducing her, and as I was walking through the building, just the common refrain that I heard from all the ladies was, what are you doing here? <laughs> but then their second question was, or their second remark was, this is awesome. And you could just see the joy and the excitement and just kind of the, the, the feeling, the anticipation that God was up to something special. And I, I was here Friday night. I, I wasn't able to be here yesterday because I was preparing the sermon, but I was at home watching a private stream of the, um, of the services and just listening to all of the communicators. <coughs> and um, it was just incredible to just sit and listen and see how God was moving and to see women praying for women and just the community that was formed and born. And it was just an amazing weekend. And I just wanted to, as lead pastor of this church, just acknowledge that that was a special weekend, something significant something incredible and something worthy of being celebrated. I really feel like this is something that we'll look back on and go, that was the beginning of something really awesome at Church on the Move. So hats off to the team who put it together. Just an incredible weekend all around for our Daughters Conference. Let's give it up for them. Everything that happened, it was so good. And then next weekend is going to be an awesome weekend as well, because like Andrew said, Next weekend is not only Super Bowl weekend, but it's Super Baptism weekend, and we're not only coming and supporting our teams, and I want to invite you to bring your gear, wear your gear next weekend, whatever your football team is, whether that's the Chiefs. How many Chiefs fans we got out there? All right, there's a few Chiefs fans. 49ers fans, anybody 49ers fans? Clearly a lot more 49ers fans than Chiefs fans. I heard that in my spirit. And... Um, I'm a 49ers fan, so I just, I gotta, I gotta represent the 49ers. So next week I'll be in my 49ers gear, you bring your gear. If, they, if you're not a Chiefs or 49ers fan, wear your Dallas gear or, or OU gear or whatever team you support, Lincoln, whatever it is that you, uh, whoever it is that you follow, wear your gear. We're gonna have root beer, candy, food out here. It's gonna be an awesome weekend, but we're also gonna be baptizing people next weekend. So next weekend's gonna be a really special weekend. And then also next weekend, I'm answering the most contentious question of this whole series. How would Jesus approach politics in 2020? Which basically is the weekend that I get to make everybody angry, and I can't wait. It's going to be so fun. So be here next weekend for that, and then also next weekend I'm going to be revealing what are the, uh, the next five questions that we're going to answer. And these are questions that you've submitted. So if you haven't submitted a question yet, you can do that by going to cotm.info, and you can submit a question there anonymously. Um, or you can do it on social media. It's not anonymous there, but either way, we would love to hear your questions. We'll gather those, and then next week, I'll tell you where we're going to go for the next five weeks, so don't miss next weekend, and if you've got friends, invite them. Of course you have friends. You're not a bunch of losers. You have friends. Bring them next week. <laughs> Bring them next week, and uh, what a great week to invite somebody. Have them here uh, next weekend as we do our, our super baptism weekend. All right, what's the deal with water baptism? We, we did this strategically, this is just before our baptism weekend, and we wanted to answer this question because 
I think a lot of us kind of understand that there is a practice of baptism within the church, but what's its significance? What's the meaning of getting dunked under the water? I, I remember my baptism. I was probably, I don't know, 13, 14 years old, was just starting to care a lot about being cool and being an individual and being really unique. And I'd seen people be baptized before, and I always thought it looked so stupid when people held their nose like this to be baptized. And I thought, I, I don't want to do that. i got to find a way to do that. So we'd had a pool in the backyard, and I found out that if I went backwards under the water and exhaled air out through my nose, that I wouldn't have to hold my nose. So we were in the auditorium, and my dad was baptizing me, and I, we had a, like a, it's an old auditorium over on the, uh, our first building, and, and there was like right over here kind of a cutout on the wall, and there was a baptismal tank, and I come up there, and, and uh, my dad's going to baptize me, and he's like, hold your nose, and I'm like, I got this. I know, how to, I know what I'm doing, and he's like, hold your nose. I'm like, yes, sir. I hold my nose. <laughs> Boom. He baptizes me, right? So I was more concerned with looking cool being baptized and actually what the whole thing meant. So what does it mean to be baptized and why do we do it and why has the Christian uh, church practiced baptism for 2,000 years? What's its significance? So I want us to kind of talk about that this morning and to do that I want us to go all the way back to the beginning and kind of ask some really basic questions or look at baptism from a really sort of foundational place. And the first thing you need to know is this, that there are two views of baptism traditionally, historically, within the Christian church, and it kind of depends on what church tradition you came from. So I'll explain the first view is that some churches view baptism as a sacrament. So that's your first fill in the blank. So grab your pen, your notes. If you have this, you're going to need these. If you don't have these, just wave, and we'll get you one of these or a pen because you're going to need both. And I would love for you to follow along with me. But the first view is uh, a sacrament. We view, some churches view baptism as a sacrament. Now, what does that mean? Well, the basic idea, and it's here in your notes, is that God is acting. God is doing something supernatural. If you came out of a, a Catholic background, or maybe you were uh, Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian, um, Eastern Orthodox, although there's probably not too many of those around here. But if you come out of more, maybe a more mainline, traditional church background, often they view baptism as a sacrament. And what that means is they view that God is doing something supernatural. The individual isn't so much responding as it is God is choosing. And this is significant. If you've ever wondered why certain churches baptize babies, and you've thought, that's so weird, I don't get that. Maybe you come out of a, a charismatic or a non-denominational or Baptist background, and you've wondered, what's the deal with, you know, the Catholic church or other churches doing, uh, you know, infant baptism? Is that really even baptism? Babies can't choose Jesus all of that kind of thing. Why do they do that? Well, they don't believe that the baby is choosing anything. They believe that God and the church are choosing. And so what they're doing is they're kind of setting that baby apart, and God is supernaturally infusing his grace so that that baby is beginning a lifelong discipleship journey with Christ. So when you look at it that way, it's, it's kind of a beautiful thing. Even though you may not agree with that or practice that, I think it's kind of a beautiful thing that those churches practice. Now, our church and others view baptism in a different way. The second way that we view baptism is as an ordinance, as an ordinance. And the key idea with this sort of view of baptism is that we are responding. So in the first view, God is acting. In this view, we are responding. This means that when we come to faith in Christ, we respond through baptism. So we don't believe that anything supernatural happens whenever you're baptized, that God is not acting supernaturally, but rather we're responding to God's supernatural act. So when we receive Christ and we're reborn, remade, we talk about being a born-again Christian, and we talked about that in week one of this series. If you want to know more about that, go back and listen to that, because I talk about it in detail. But we believe that baptism is a response to something that God does. So sacrament means that um, God is doing something supernatural. To view it as an ordinance believes that we are responding. And if you want to know where does church on the move fit on this spectrum, we believe that baptism is an ordinance. We believe it's something that um, we respond to. Now, if you come from a different tradition, maybe you have a different church background, or you've always viewed baptism as one of the sacraments of the church, that's okay. We're not in disagreement with you. We're not trying to correct you or change you. We just happen to practice baptism more as an ordinance than we think of it like a sacrament. So that's kind of a beginning of sort of how the church approaches baptism. But what does it mean? What's its significance and what does it mean to go under the water and reemerge and all of this? What's the significance of that? I want to talk about three things 
that baptism means for us. So when you're baptized, if you're going to be baptized in the future, or if you've already been baptized, it'll give you a helpful handle or understanding of what happened when you were baptized and what was the significance of it, what's its meaning. So the first thing that we want to look at is this. Number one, baptism means a new life. Baptism means a new life. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, writes this. He says, we, those of us who are Christ's followers, he says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too may live a new life. When you go under the waters of baptism, you're identifying with Christ. If you get baptized at Church on the Move, one of the things that you're going to hear our pastors say when they baptize you is as you're going under the water, we say, you are buried with Christ. And when you come back up, we say, and now you're raised to new life. So you're, you're identifying with the baptism of Jesus, but you're also identifying with the death burial and resurrection of Jesus. So going under the water is what Paul is talking about here, being baptized into death, but you're raised to new life. Now, the easiest way, I think, for us to kind of understand the implications of this whole new life idea that is carried within baptism is to look in detail at the baptism of Jesus. And we just read from Matthew chapter 3 about the baptism of Jesus, but I want us to look at three specific elements that are present in the baptism of Jesus that I think are really helpful for the way that we think about baptism. The first is the water, the water, and this represents chaos and judgment. Now, I have the word judgment down, but you might just write down with that chaos, judgment, and disorder, because I think disorder might be a little bit more helpful understanding for what the water is symbolic of in baptism. When we read through scripture, Water is always present when there's chaos and disorder. When we look at Genesis chapter 1, we see the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it says the earth was without form and void, or the earth was in chaos or in disorder. And it says the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep, over the face of the waters. What do we see? We see that there's waters, and that water represents chaos and disorder, and out of that chaos and disorder comes new life. Fast forward just a couple of chapters into Genesis, and we read the same kind of idea when we read the story of, of Noah. What happens with Noah? Well, God tells Noah to build an ark. Why? Because there's rain coming. There's a flood coming, and what happens with the flood? It brings chaos, disorder, judgment, but what happens out of that, out of that chaos and disorder comes new life. Salvation comes through Noah and his family out of the, as they emerge out of the ark. We see the same thing as we fast forward a few chapters further into Exodus chapter 2, and we read about the birth of Moses, who would incidentally be a salvation or a point of salvation, used for salvation for God's people. But right when Moses was born, his life was under threat because the Pharaoh said that all the kids in, in, of the, uh, the Jews were going to be killed. And so what did Moses' mother do? She puts him in a basket and then puts that basket in the Nile River. Now, it's interesting because the word basket, that Hebrew word basket, is the same exact word that's used for ark in the story of Noah and the ark. So Moses was put into an ark, and what happens? He, the ark goes into the water, and so there's chaos and disorder happening with God's people. But what happens? Out of that emerges a savior. Salvation comes through the water. So we go down into the chaos, and out of the chaos comes new life. We would see the same thing when the children of Israel pass through the waters of the Red Sea. What happens? They're passing through the chaos of the Red Sea, but it's also their salvation. Same thing with Jesus. When Jesus shows up, he is baptized. He descends down into the water. And it's symbolic for what Jesus actually did. Because when Jesus left heaven and he steps into human flesh and blood, he would quite literally pass through the waters of the birth canal as a sort of baptism. And he is baptized into flesh and blood. I love the way the message translation 
talks about this in John 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. That's what happened when Jesus took on flesh and blood. It was a sort of baptism. He's descending into the chaos, not his chaos, but ours. The chaos of the human condition, the brokenness of this world, the sin and death and betrayal and destruction. And Jesus is baptized into that. So when he's baptized later on at 30 years old, that baptism is just symbolic of what had already happened. And we get this because John looks at Jesus and he goes, why, are you, why am I baptizing you? You should be baptizing me. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. Do this because this is going to be instructive for everybody who's coming after me. This is setting a pattern. Jesus wasn't baptized for himself. He was baptized for you. And he's putting this pattern out there that as we descend into the chaos, only when we descend into the chaos can new life emerge. And th th this is a huge concept. Because if you're unwilling to face the chaos and disorder of your life, new life can never emerge. So many of us, we just want to kind of like act like that's not there. Talk about something else. Go somewhere else. Ignore what's really going on in our lives, hoping that we can just move on and move past it. But unless you're willing to descend into the chaos, new order cannot emerge. New life cannot come. Now, here's the second piece of good news is that if your life is in chaos right now, if there's disarray, if there's disorder, if there's brokenness, I got good news for you this morning. We serve a God who specializes in descending into chaos. We serve a God who wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty, so to speak. God didn't try to save you from a distance. He wasn't plugging his nose and reaching out and going, okay, okay, let me try to see what I can do here. He got down in it with us. That's the kind of God that we serve. But he didn't get down in it with us just to commiserate. He got down in it with us to bring the second thing that we see in Jesus' baptism, and that is the spirit, which represents new life. There's new life available to you. See, whenever you give your life to Christ, your spirit is transformed. This is why Jesus said you must be born again. And baptism is symbolic of that. Why? Because you go down into the water, you're buried with Christ, and you're raised to new life. That new life isn't, that, see, baptism is an outward expression of an inward reality. It's something that's happening on the inside of you. God is at work, and he's transformed you on the inside. And so baptism is an external marker that says, yeah, this is what's happened to me internally. This is what Jesus has done in me. He's put his spirit in me. You're not just trying to be a better person. You have been transformed from the inside out. God has quite literally put his spirit in you. In fact, it says in, in, uh, in the New Testament, it says that you are a new creation. You've been bought with a price. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God has put his spirit. His dwelling place is inside of you. You are not, we are not all God together. In other words, we're not pantheistic. We don't believe that that maybe all of us sort of collectively become God together. Other religions believe that. We don't believe that. We believe that we are our individual selves, but that God chooses to dwell. A piece of him dwells on the inside of us. And that's what it means whenever the spirit descends. And we read this in, in, in the account of Jesus' baptism. As the dove comes down, the dove represents the spirit, and the spirit lands on Jesus in order to empower him for ministry. And that's why God's spirit's been put in you to empower you for ministry. I don't know if you realize that, but you have a ministry purpose. That's why we're in a year on mission. We're living a year of saying, we're gonna be on mission, on assignment for God. You're not just here to take up space until one day you go to heaven when you die, but you're here on assignment. And when you were baptized or when you gave your life to Christ, the Spirit of God came inside of you for a reason and for a purpose so that you could accomplish God's mission. You weren't just saved from something, you were saved for something. So that's what the Spirit of God represents in Jesus' baptism, and it's what it means in your baptism as well. Third thing is this, we see the voice, or hear the voice. The voice, and the voice represents a new identity. When Jesus comes up out of the water, we hear the voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What's he doing? He's giving Jesus his rightful label, his rightful identity. Friends, every single one of us have our own identities. 
And I say identities, not because we all suffer from multiple personality disorder, but because part of the human existence is to carry multiple identities. When you're born, you're just a son. When you have a sibling, you're a, a brother or a sister. When you get a little bit older, you might be husband or wife. You might be father or mother. As you get a job or you enter into career, you could be lawyer, doctor, fireman, policeman, whatever it is. You take on different identities, and depending on the different context, and some of you know exactly what this is because there are different environments that you go into where you kind of have to put on a little bit of a different persona. I, I know what this is because for me, I'm a little bit of an introvert, but when I'm on, uh, like, here on the weekends, I don't get to be an introvert. I'm a pastor, so I take that persona on, and I walk the hallways, and I, I talk to people, and I engage with people. I don't get to just sit back in a private room and kind of isolate myself with my family. I get to be out with you guys. That's not necessarily who I innately am, but that's an identity that I carry for this season of my life as this calling of God is on me. So we have different labels that we carry, and some of them are helpful, some of them are good, but some of the labels that we carry in our lives are not that helpful. Some of them are actually hurtful. Some of the labels that we have are labels that were put on us maybe by something that a family member said, a parent said, or just something that we've come to believe about ourselves. Some of us see ourselves through the lens or the label of stupid, the label of fat, the label of loser, the label of inadequate, not enough, ugly. Some of us carry labels based upon choices that we've made at other points in our life. Cheater, adulterer, liar, fornicator, whatever it might be. We carry labels around of things that we've done. Prisoner, convict, whatever it is. We carry these labels with us and we struggle to get free of these. And one of the things that we see about baptism is that when Jesus emerges from the water, God the Father looks at him and says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Can I tell you this? When you give your life to Christ, when you are in Christ and you're baptized in Christ, when you come up out of the water, you may not hear an audible voice, but it doesn't make it any less true. You now, the most fundamental eternal label about you is that you are a beloved son or daughter. You're not what other people say you are. You are who your father says you are. You get a new identity. And that's what baptism means, is that God is speaking over you and declaring over you who you truly are, so you have a new identity. Did you know that son or daughter is your most fundamental identity? It's your first identity, and it's your eternal identity. You will not always be wife. You will not always be mother. You will not always be lawyer or doctor or whatever your profession is. But one day, when you enter into eternity, you will always be son or daughter of your heavenly father. That's who you are. And so we don't have to take on the labels that other people want to impose on us or even that we want to impose upon ourselves. We can, when we're baptized, start to receive and accept that label of beloved son or daughter. This is my son. You are my son. You are my daughter in whom I am well pleased. So that's what baptism means first. It means a new identity, a new life. Second thing that baptism means is baptism means a new community a new family. Look at what it says in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Paul, writing again, he says this, so in Christ Jesus. That's a, a loaded term and a significant term, in Christ Jesus. Because when you're baptized, you're not only identifying with Christ, but in a sense you're entering into his new kingdom family. Look at what he says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. What does this mean? It means that when, you, when you're baptized, you're not just identifying with Jesus, but you're identifying with the community that Jesus came to establish. Right after Jesus was baptized, it says that he went out and he started preaching. He started preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And if you read through the Gospels, one of the things that you'll see over and over and over again is that Jesus just regularly would talk about this idea of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like, in fact, if you read many, many in fact, 
probably most of his parables center on that idea, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. He was always talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Jesus did not come to establish a individual salvation between you and him. He came to establish a new community. Later, he would refer to this as the church. In fact, in Matthew 16, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. That word church doesn't mean building or place. It actually means community, gathering of people. And so when you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into not just a, a relationship this way, but you're baptized into a relationship this way. You take on a new family, a new community of brothers and sisters in Christ. Rowan Williams said it this way. He said, baptism brings you into the neighborhood of other Christians, and there is no way to be a Christian without being in the neighborhood of other Christians. So many of us want to connect just this way to Jesus, and I hear this regularly from people going, well, I don't really, I don't know, belong to much of a church, but I have my own thing that I do with God. That's, that's fine that you do that with God, and God's not angry that you do that, but you're missing out on the fullness of what God has. God brings you into community for your benefit because God uses other people to disciple you, to change you, to grow you up in Christ. So as we think about it, if we, when we're baptized into Christ and we come up out of the water and we hear that voice where God is saying, now you are my beloved son, you're my beloved daughter, if God is now father, then what that means is that the church is filled with brothers and sisters. That's your next fill in the blank, write that down. If God is father, then the church is filled with brothers and sisters. Meaning, the people next to you, God placed here. And I hope you hear this. I'm going to slow down because I see you writing and I want to give you a minute here. But I want you to consider this. What if God brought you to this church, not so much for the connection that you would have with me, my teaching, what it is that I'm sharing with you, but what if God brought you here to learn from somebody down the aisle from you? What if God brought somebody else here not just so that they could attend here, but so that they could be next to you because they were going to be a key part of your story. They're going to be a key part of your community. They were going to be a key part of your discipleship and development. See, so many people, they come to a church and we want to connect to the pastor. And I get that. I'm cool with that. I understand that. I'm out in the lobby and I hear from so many of you, you're like, hey, wait, man, I love it here and this and that. And I'd love to go get co coffee with you. And I would love to go get coffee with you. But I have a wife. And I have five kids, and I'm trying to run a church, and I got a team to run. And it's not that I, I just don't have time for the, the small people, the little people to sit down with all of you, but it's just like, man, I can't, I can't love my wife and kids well and be spending all of the time with everybody who wants to take me to lunch or take me to coffee. And I do that when I can, but here's the thing. God understood this and knew this in advance, and that's why if you look down your row, you're going to see there are other people around you. And they have time, some of them, to go to coffee because they're not having to go to coffee with everybody in the church, but they might be able to go to coffee with you and get in a small group with you and be in community with you. Friends, God uses people to grow people. And I, I want to say this to you. I think one of Satan's greatest tricks, one of the, the greatest pitfalls that he has for the modern American church is that we believe that we can do it on our own. And some of you have set out this year to say, I want 2020 to be the best year of my life spiritually. Can I tell you, the odds of that happening go up exponentially when you commit not to do it alone. So many of us are trying to carry our burdens alone. Nobody really knows what's going on in our lives. I meet with people all the time and like, I've not told anybody this. I'm like, why not? I, I get it. It's difficult. Uh, I don't want to be embarrassed or I don't want to burden anybody else. But friends... That's what the church is for. That's what other believers are for. They're there to walk with you. And that's why right now I would challenge you, get in a small group. Our, the, the semester is beginning right now, and it's not too late. And don't tell yourself that you don't have time. This is what you're on the planet for. This is what you're here for, to pursue Jesus. This is what you're going to do for eternity, so you might as well get started now. 
Get into a circle, get around a community and allow people to speak into your life and take off your mask and be real with somebody. Friends, you don't have to be real with everybody, but you need to be real with somebody. What's going on in your life? Does somebody know your story, your struggle, your secrets? Are they walking with you? Are they praying for you? Are they in your life, in your circle, journeying with you? That's what God put the church here for. Now let me say one more thing about this and then I'm gonna move on and hit point three. Here's what I'm seeing these days, and I see this a lot, and I'm seeing this more and more and more. I'm seeing people kind of withdraw from the church as community because of pain that they've endured at the hands of the church. I'm seeing people kind of back off from, they're not letting go of their faith altogether, they're just going, I don't know about, I don't know if I can trust this, I don't know if the church, this or that, and it's because they've been hurt by a church. And I'm not saying it's not legitimate. It is. In fact, I'm just going to tell you, at Church on the Move, we've hurt lots of people over the years. That's just part of being human and being flawed and being messed up. Is we have blind spots, we do stupid stuff, we miss people. There are people that are hurting that we miss, that we ignore, that we should reach out to, and I get it. And some of that, we try to correct and we try to do the best that we can at being real about our faults and our shortcomings. But here's the deal. The enemy would love to do nothing more than to remind you continually of the flaws of the church. And believe me, the church is flawed. I've been working here for over 25 years, and the church is flawed. We're not perfect, but guess what? Nobody is. And from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of the book, we read that God continually worked through really messed up people, liars, adulterers, murderers, God worked through. And so many times we have the, the, we struggle, and I see this especially with young people, and if you've struggled with this, I want to speak this to you. Some of you are like, man, that person that God used to speak to me at a certain point to strengthen my faith, I now kind of got to be behind the scenes, and I saw that they had some real serious flaws. Or, or, or they, they failed me, like significantly failed me, like there was a moral failure and they weren't who they said they were or whatever, and you're wondering, did God, did, was any of that real? Did God really even minister to me through them? Here's, here's my answer for you. The answer is yes. You would not believe God works through people who have hidden sin in their life. God works through people who are doing messed up stuff behind the scenes. Somehow, God works through these, those people. And I'm not saying, please understand me, I'm not saying that their behavior is, is something that we condone or wink at just because God uses them. I'm just saying that God is, see, God's not looking for perfect vessels to be able to work through, otherwise nothing would get done. So he's working through the imperfect people that he has in order to reach us. And if you think that God is only working through perfect people, then guess what? God's never going to use you. Because you're in the same boat with the rest of us. It may just be that you don't see your sin as significant as the sin of other people. So we, don't, we dare not pull back from community and say, I can't be a part of that because they're not perfect. We press in because to be baptized is to identify with the very thing that Jesus identified with. Think about it. When Jesus was baptized, he was identifying with the brokenness of our community, and we admire him for it. Yet we would say, well, I'll wait till everybody's got their act together before I'll come into the water. Did Jesus do that with you? He's not waiting for you to get your act together to get into your life. Why should you wait for everybody else to get their act together to get into their life? That's worthy of a round of applause. Come on, put your hands together for that. That's a good truth right there. So let's not back off from the community that we've been baptized into. Amen? Third thing is this. Baptism means a new allegiance. It means a new allegiance. Allegiance. When I was uh, younger, and I don't hear this so much anymore, but it was really prominent whenever I was coming up in the church. Kind of the, the main evangelism tactic that we were given, it was this one specific question. And if you went through any evangelism training, especially in churches like ours, then you probably heard this question over and over again. Maybe you were led to Christ by this question. If you were to die tonight, how many of you know this question right here? <laughs> if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? And what we do is we'd ask that question and you look for the answer. If somebody says, well, I, I would go to heaven, you say, okay, how do you know? 
and then you listen for their response, and, and then you talk to them about Jesus, and here, here's essentially what you say. You say, well, here's the deal. If you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, let me tell you, Jesus came, and he died for you because you're a sinner, and you can't save yourself, so you needed somebody to come and pay the price for your sin so that one day when you die, you go to heaven, and you spend eternity with Jesus. How many of you heard something like that at one point in your life? Yeah, a lot of hands going up. That's how so many of us came to faith in Christ. And I'm not here to tell you that that's wrong, but I do want to tell you that it's incomplete. Because what it does is it puts this sort of undue or maybe overemphasis on heaven. Now, I'm not trying to minimize heaven in, in, in a sense because, well, there's nothing wrong with, with heaven and I'm not trying to paint a different picture of heaven, but salvation or what Jesus came to do, let me put it this way, has a whole lot more to do than just, your, than just your eternal destiny. In other words, Jesus came for a different reason than just to make sure that you go up instead of down when you die. What that means is that Jesus is more than just a savior. And for so many of us, and I want to say this because I think this is significant in Oklahoma and in the Bible Belt specifically. See, if you've ever wondered, why is it that people can profess Jesus as Savior, but when we look at their lives, there's not much transformation or change in their life? They just seem to, we just, and maybe you're, and, and by the way, I'm holding my hands up, both hands up here, and I say, this is me. Like, I lived this for 30 plus years of my life. So I profess Jesus as Savior and would even tell you that I loved Jesus as Savior, but I didn't know Jesus as Lord. And there's a real difference between understanding who Jesus is as a savior, which puts me at the center of the narrative. So this is the problem with the whole, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven kind of thing, is it makes everything about you. Jesus came to die to pay for your sins so that you could go to heaven and have a wonderful, you know, eternal bliss. But the story of the Bible is not a story about you. I hate to break it to you, but the Bible is not a book about you. The Bible is a book about Jesus. From cover to cover, it starts with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. You go, wait, I, I'm reading Genesis, I, I don't see Jesus in there. He's there, you just have to know how to look. The beginning of the story is Jesus and friends, the end of the story is Jesus. And let me tell you this, the story doesn't end with Jesus on a cross, it ends with Jesus on a throne. And there's a difference, some of you only know Jesus on the cross. Jesus, save me from my sins. Jesus, I want to go to heaven. So you've prayed a prayer, and you've prayed it lots of times, just to be sure. Just make sure you got all your bases covered. And I get this question a lot. How can I know? How do I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die? Listen, Jesus' main concern was not so much with making sure you get to go to heaven when you die. His main concern was that you would be in relationship with him. That's why he came to establish a kingdom. And guess what? Kingdoms have kings. That's why Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so when we read the gospel from the New Testament, we don't read this me-centered gospel that says, I needed a savior for my sins. We read this story about Jesus, what he came to do, and who Jesus is. Let me read this to you from Philippians chapter 2. This is Paul writing, and we're going to close with this. I'll invite Marcos out here. We're going to close this way. I want to read this to you. Listen to this. Uh, did I even say point three yet? Baptism means a new allegiance. Did I say that? Did we get that? Okay. I, I, I get lost sometimes up here, so forgive me. I want to make sure you get all your, 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 your notes filled in because some of y'all are OCD, and if I leave one of these, I know it's going to drive you crazy. <laughs> I might do it one week just to mess with you. <laughs> Philippians 2. Follow along with me. This is beautiful. It's talking about Jesus. And notice how he talks about him. He says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be used to his own advantage, this version says. Rather, he made himself nothing. Think about that. He made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's that idea, Jesus hanging on the cross, paying for the sins of humanity. All true. But notice Paul doesn't end there. 
he continues, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, to the glory of God the Father. See, the story of the gospel is a story about how God loved you so much that he died for you so that you could love him, so that you could have relationship with him. But it also continues from there because it means that Jesus, when he died, he was resurrected. Meaning that one day we also will be resurrected. And Jesus ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne of God, establishing a new kingdom, a new order, a new reality. We don't see him fully in charge today, but one day we will. And one day Jesus will return, and when he returns, he'll make all things new. Everything broken will be undone. Everything messed up will be reborn, be remade, be renewed. That's the end of the story. And one day heaven will descend and come to earth, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth, and we will live under the glorious rule and reign of Jesus. That's the end of the story. And so when you give your life to Christ and when you're baptized, here's what's happening. You're not just saying, Jesus, you're my savior. You're saying, Jesus, you are Lord. In the first century when Christians would say, Jesus is Lord, that phrase had a real cost to it. We can say Jesus is Lord these days in this part of the world. In fact, I can drive down my highway and see a big sign that says Jesus is Lord. And so far as I can tell, nobody really cares, blinks, notices. It's just sitting there. Jesus is Lord. She said that in the first century. It was dangerous. It was controversial. Why? Because they were subverting a common statement, which was Caesar is Lord. And so when the first Christians would declare Jesus as Lord, they were literally taking their lives into their hands. To declare Christ was to declare a new allegiance, to say, I belong to a different kingdom. I'm not under Caesar, I'm under Jesus. I come under a different rule and it costs them something. And friends, even though socially it doesn't cost us anything to say Jesus is Lord, personally, when you say Jesus is Lord, there's gonna be a cost because it means you don't belong to the same community you used to belong to. You don't run with the same people you used to run with. It doesn't mean we cut them off and we act like they're, you know, some outsiders, terrible people, but it means we now belong to a new community and we, we, we live in a new reality. I don't get to spend my money the way that I want anymore. I don't get to live my life the way that I want anymore. And that's offensive to our American ideals because we believe in freedom above all else. I hear my kids say this all the time, well, it's a free country, which basically means I can do what I want. But I got news for you, when you're baptized, it ain't a free country anymore. Not the way you think of it. You belong to somebody else. It says in the New Testament, I have been bought at a price. I am not my own. That's why Paul would refer to himself as a slave. And if that's starting to rub you the wrong way, then I say good. Because now it's starting to bump up against your independent ideas of what you think freedom really is. See, you were not made just to govern yourself. You were made to submit to a king. I got good news for you. The king that I'm calling you to submit to, he's the best. He's the best. And he'll change your life in ways that you can't possibly imagine. But it does require that you bow your knee. That's why Jesus said, if anybody would come to me, he must take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. That's what it means to have Jesus as Lord. Last fill in the blank. I'm not going to leave you hanging. When you're baptized, you take on a new identity, a new community, and lastly, a new Lord. A new Lord. I want to give you an opportunity today For some of you to say Jesus is Lord like never before. Some of you, you believe in Jesus as Savior. You'd say, oh yeah, I prayed a prayer. Maybe you were even baptized before. That's okay. You need to say Jesus is Lord in a new way. 
And the way I want to invite you to do that is to get baptized next week. Somebody said, we'd have already been baptized. That's all right. It, it won't hurt to get dunked again. I'm not trying to get you to, to, to be baptized again. I'm just saying, if you're in a place where you say, wit, I'm feeling God do something in me. There's something new happening. God's moving in me. 2020 is a new year for me. I feel, I feel connected to this idea of Jesus is Lord, and I want to go public with this. I want to acknowledge what Jesus is already doing in my life. I want next weekend to be a stake in the ground. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do you different than all the other services. I want every head up, every eye open. That's you right now. I want you boldly and courageously to say, what, that's me, I'm taking a stand for Jesus this year. I want to say Jesus is Lord. I'm declaring that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you just slip your hand up right here in front of you? Uh, right there, look at this. Hands all over the place. All over the place. Praise God. Praise God. That's awesome. All right, here's what I want you to do. Prayer team, would you come up? Would you come up? I got our prayer team going to come down front. Where are you at, prayer team? Don't be shy. Come on down. We're going to be down here in the front. These are good people down here. These are good people. Gosh. Can I just look at you guys? Thank you. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. This prayer team, these are good people down here. These are people I go to for prayer. These are people who give me counsel. Here's what I want. You raised your hand. We're going to get up and dismiss here in a second. When everybody else goes out, you come forward. You find them. All they're going to do is they're going to pray with you, help you get connected to be baptized next weekend. Next weekend is your stake in the ground, your moment where you're going to say, Jesus, I'm putting you first. You're Lord of my life. And next weekend is going to be a great weekend for you and your life and your family because you're going to say Jesus is Lord in a whole new way. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I want to just pray over you and then we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done today. Wow. So many hands in all the services. Thank you so much. Lord, I pray that this would be the beginning of a real journey. That, that, that they would see you as Lord. That's been my prayer, Lord, for so long that people would see you. It's not about me. It's about you. Lord, I pray that they would connect with you in such a real and tangible way that as they start this journey, Lord, the seed that's been planted would bear much fruit. Give them the courage that as they've raised their hand in front of everybody, they would be willing to walk down here in front of everybody. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said amen. Well, are you glad you came to church today? Man, wasn't this just an encouraging weekend? I love, I love getting to talk about this. Do me a favor, stand to your feet. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to do this a little differently. I'm going to pronounce a blessing. As I'm saying the blessing, those of you who raised your hand, I want you and everybody else just make way because there's going to be a lot of people. You saw all the hands get up. I want you to come down front. And if you saw somebody that raised their hand that's maybe being a little bit scared to do this, here's what I want. You grab them. Go with them. And then if you're watching online or you couldn't do it right now, here's what I want you to do. You can go to cotm.info and click on what's happening. You can register to be baptized there. So as I'm saying the blessing, you raise your hand, get up out of your seat, come down front, meet with these that are gathered down here, our prayer team. We would love to pray for you. You ready? May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You guys that raise your hands, come on forward. Let's do it. God bless you guys. I'll see you next week.